Diverse Medicine is Dr. Dale. Um, we're here filming Black Men and White Coats episode number two. If you haven't seen episode number one, make sure you check it out. We got a lot of great feedback on it, so you're in for a really big surprise on this video. We're fortunate enough to get two deans, Dean Brenda Armstrong, who's here at Duke University School of Medicine. She's a dean of medical admissions here, and assistant dean, Dr. Cedric Bright, who is the immediate past president of the National Medical Association. We've got them both here on this video. Um, you don't want to miss this video, I'm telling you. All the questions that you ever had that you would like to ask a dean about how to get into medical school, they address here on this video. I have to warn you, it's a little bit long, about an hour and a half, an hour and 45 minutes, so what we'll do is we'll break it up into three segments. I also have to warn you that the latter half, the latter segments, are going to be of poor video quality due to some technical difficulties, but do not miss it. Make sure you watch the entire thing, all three segments. You're going to enjoy it. You're going to be happy you watched it. It's got some great information, some great insight from people who are actually deans and who sit on the missions committee. I have some great information for you as to how to get into medical school. Black Men and White Coats, episode number two. Enjoy it, okay? Hey, Diverse Medicine, it's Dr. Dale. I'm sitting here at Duke University Medical Center with Dr. Brenda Armstrong here to my right. She is the Dean of um, Medical Student Admission here at Duke University. To my left is Dr. Cedric Bright. He's Assistant Dean at University of North Carolina and former, actually immediate past president of the National Medical Association. And the idea today is to give you guys an inside look at what goes on behind the doors in the Medical School Admissions Committee. So we all apply to med school, we cross our fingers, we pray, we hope we get in. But we have two deans here who sat on the admissions committees who can actually tell us what goes on behind those doors, what we need to be thinking about when we submit our applications. So let's just jump right into it. And I'll probably ask, okay, this is probably the most pertinent question that I think minorities are going to ask. How important is the MCAT? for medical school acceptance? Well, you can that its importance varies from school to school. There are some schools that are absolutely driven by MCAT scores, and a lot of that has to do with their perceived or real rankings by U.S. News and World Report. Um, there have been many, many voices that have tried to sort of neutralize that position and remind students that MCATs don't just get you into medical school. They're one piece of data. And an application that is competitive includes many more things other than a one-time score for a very high stakes test that there is some evidence of cultural bias. And I would concur that, and the other aspect of it is, is, is that, you know, the MCAT, it really is dependent upon who the person that you will interview with. There's some people that I, all they know is numbers, uh, because that's what they've always been told. There are other people that understand that, that what we are really looking for more now is a holistic picture of the student. So, as Dr. Armstrong mentioned, you know, the MCAT is a high-state, one-day test. Mm -hmm. Well, that one-day test may not be reflective of your intellectual capability. That your four years of undergraduate or your two years in a master's program or your year in a post bat may actually be a better ind an, an indicator of your performance going into a medical school. So we struggle with this on our admissions committees. Uh, because we know that the MCAT is really, in a lot of ways, more reflective of not necessarily success in medical school, because we know from the AAMC, which is the Association of American Medical Colleges, that an MCAT, there is no difference in the graduation rate between an MCAT of 24 and an MCAT of 34. Mm -hmm. but what it, or 35. What it actually may correlate to mm -hmm. is how they may perform on another standardized exam. Yeah. So, understanding that there's no different in the graduation rate, then why do we put so much emphasis on it? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. So, if I'm, a, if I'm a college student applying for medical school, and I'll just make it up a number, let's say I get a 22 on my MCAT, and I have an average GPA, you know, I've done a little bit of research, I've done some shadowing, I've taken the MCAT twice, I've got a 22 both times, should I apply to medical school? Or should I wait to get a higher score? If you wait to get a higher score, you're going to be waiting to go to medical school. 
Um, there is nice data from the AAMC that people raise their MCAT score by an average of one point. So you may get a 23, and it is not an inexpensive test. So, again, this whole business of, of the obsession with MCATs is driven by a whole different set of forces that has nothing to do with predicting how successful you're going to be in med school. The other thing, the larger question here is, who should go to medical school? Yeah. You know, and, and as a, an applicant, you need to ask yourself in the context of what we are challenged with where healthcare is concerned, and especially disparities are concerned in this country as well as globally, then we need to ask a much bigger question, and that is what are those components that we are looking for increasingly in a student who can do medicine. You have to be able to do the science and think logically, but you get that logical thinking from philosophy just as well as you get it from science. Yeah. Now all science does is to ask you to take a set of facts and interpret those facts in a logical way. So some of the very best students that have come to this medical school didn't even major in science. They did something else. Um, so you ha but you have to be able to do the science. You have to be able to take a bunch of facts and then distill from those facts what the point is. Yeah. And then how to apply it. And then how to teach somebody else. Not just another student or somebody who is another learner. But how you teach the patient. Because what you are is a teacher for them. So, in addition to consistent performance in academics, both humanities as well as in the, the traditional sciences, there's that other piece as well. And we have some data. One of the things we did was we asked the people who were going to receive this group of people coming out being doctors, what they wanted. And to a person, they said, we don't want dumb doctors. They were very clear. Yeah. We don't want dumb doctors. And so I said, well, what does that mean? I said, find those people who are naturally inquisitive, who ask the annoying questions in class that nobody else wants to ask because they're too afraid, but they're not afraid. You know, listen to them. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the person who has straight A's, but it does have to be someone who has figured it out. Do not be so arrogant to think that there are people who stumble at first. But it's not about the stumble, it's about what you do after the stumble. That's right, that's right. Mm -hmm. it, ask, ask yourself, do you want a doctor who has had to struggle and maybe had to work while trying to maintain this fierce academic focus, if they're able to do that, do you make them work when they go to medical school? No, you don't. So when you take away that burden, their brilliance comes out. Think about the person who is the first one from their family to get to college, much less medical school. Somebody thought they couldn't do it, but they did it anyway, and therefore they have already outperform someone's expectations. expectation. Yeah. You know, so that is what describes a kind of brilliance that the folks who are going to receive us want. Do not think that because somebody's done research when they were in the undergraduate school that that puts them a step ahead. Anybody who does research as a student is an indentured servant. What research mm -hmm. teaches them is how to fail and then get up and go back. Research teaches them to think outside the box, gives them the license to do that so they can ask the right questions of someone who thinks they know it all, but they really don't know. Yeah. One of the best examples here is Bob Lepkowitz, who just won the Nobel Prize. And one of the things he said was, when I asked him, 
who should I be looking for? He said, find those people who are not afraid to fail. I have failed more than I have succeeded. But the successes pale compared to, you know, the number of times I fail. So academically, that is what we have to wrap our heads around in fashioning a set of ways to look for those things. We call it capable of brilliance. They're not there, but capable of brilliance. And then on the other hand, it was people who were like our patients who said, but that's not good enough. It's not good enough just to be smart, which I thought was wonderful. And so I said, well, what is it? I knew what they were going to say. What they said was, find those people whose life experiences, who have been smart enough to be vulnerable and go to where the real people are and learn that respect and dignity are never negotiable. You don't learn that in a classroom. You learn it by taking yourself to places where there are people who are not like you, who were not raised like you, who didn't have the same economic or educational opportunities that you may have, but their intelligence is just as good, if not better, than yours. And they can teach you those values that you might not have been lucky enough to have had passed to you by your parents and your family's history. And if you take that combination of academic, capable of brilliance, and people who understand that respect and dignity are never, ever negotiable. That's the mix that ought to move us way ahead where medicine is concerned. And so what the really good schools are doing is to put that into practice in the admissions process, which means that there have to be people on the admissions committees that look like the people that we are trying to prepare for in the community. They have to be on the committee. And the LCME, the Licensure Committee on Medical Education, the body that says you can be a medical school has figured it out. And their most recent set of regulations which they will hold medical schools accountable for in that document, they give the medical schools the right to have people other than faculty on those committees who make those decisions. Oh, wow. So the importance of that is that those committees are now bringing that sense, that holistic sense of these are the things we want to look for in a medical student to the table. So when you say people other than faculty, what? What, what are for instance, people? students. Yep. For instance, people from the community. Oh, well. yep. For instance, patient advocates can be on the committee. Right. That is That's a sea change in terms of how medical schools have gone about their work across the board. And that's happening now. That's happening now. All right. That that's the that. 2012. Um, new version of the LCME document that's called the structure and functions of a medical school. That is the document that we live and die by in medical school. Right now. Yeah. Right now. Exactly. But I, 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 Dr. Dell, I want to get back to the original question, which was, should that person apply? And I think that Dr. Armstrong has given us a very eloquent discussion of the, of the big macro aspect of it. On the micro perspective, though, you know, students have to do some of their due diligence. Schools that have less of a history mm -hmm. are going to be more apt to rely on the MCAT because they're trying to get that great ranking. And they're starting from nowhere trying and trying to build it. Okay. Schools like Duke have the luxury of having a reputation, <laughs> like Stanford, have a reputation. So they can think out of the box and try novel ways in which to really look at the student. You know, 
part of it is looking at how do we actually interview a student? How do we standardize the interview? You know, uh, various schools use this new concept called a multiple mini interview. Duke is one of them. <clears throat> and in using a multiple mini interview, you can sometimes take away the bias that can occur in a in a one on one interview. Okay, so so multiple mini interview meaning that you have you'll like have speed dating like dates. speed dating for for interviewing. So okay. you'll have like ten rooms. Each room has a to a topic or a subject or a tagline on the door. Person reads the tagline, opens the door, goes in and talks to the person inside about that, that particular topic. Wow. Okay? So, from that way, we, you, you get sometimes a, a better view of the student, holistically, than you do with one person who, when the student walks in the door, already has a bias. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, the other aspect, though, you know, that 22 MCAT may be acceptable at certain schools. Mm -hmm. So what you have to do is you have to do your homework exactly. and know which schools. And the AAMC produces a book that puts out the information that allows students to know which are the scores that most of the students get at a certain school where they're admitted. You can go through that book to get an idea of what scores you need to have in order to apply successfully to a school. So I think that that would help in that aspect. Now, uh, it's, but the, let us not focus totally on the MCAT, mm -hmm. okay? Because if that person has done four years as an undergraduate and has a GPA that is substantial, 3.8, 3.9, mm -hmm. and they score 22, that's no different than the person who, who had a 3.9 in high school and had a bad SAT score. Yeah. You know, colleges were able to overlook that SAT score and understand that, that student had the ability, right? Mm -hmm. And admit them. The same thing is what's going to happen eventually, I see, in, I think, in medical school. Mm -hmm. uh, as we move forward and understand the processes as the licensure board has given us mandate, mm -hmm. and as well as, as we have experience, you know, we have people that are 4.0s. We have people that have 35 MCATs. Hmm. They don't get into medical school, too. Yeah. You know, so it's not all about having the top scores. You know, you have to be able to, ex to exhibit the qualities of humanitarianism, of an in inquisitive nature, of uh, uh, being dependable, being reliable. You know, all of these are characteristics that you can find in people that do other things in life such as people who go out and wait tables. You know, they have to be dependable, they have to deal with the public, they have to be humble. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when the, when, the, when the customer thinks that they're right, you know, mm -hmm. these are all kinds of things that we have to consider when we think about what's going to make a good doctor. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just not about the books, it's about the holistic aspect of the person. Okay. One, so, of, one of the things that, you know, that we use as medical schools is to ask probing questions of the students in the application. So, you know, there's the standardized AMCAS application. It's more like an inventory of specific things. And then each school has the ability to fashion what's called the secondary application. And every school's secondary applications are different. But in the course of, of that, asking those questions on the secondary, many of us ask questions that there's no right answer. There's your answer. And then on the other side of that is having a variety of people who may be consumers in medicine read those and to read for depth, to see if all those things that the students list, you know, on the AMCAS application, they get to list all the stuff they've done, how long they did it. They don't really get to tell us what they got out of it. They just, it's a laundry list. So one of the things we want to know is how did it change you? Who, what kind of person are you now that you've done all those things? Um, how have you dealt with adversity? How have you dealt with somebody that disappointed you because they did something that you knew was wrong and then ask you to cover up for them. 
how did you, what have you gotten from the community that raised you? Well, what were the values that you have gleaned from living 15, 16 years in the same community? So all these are examples of these secondary These are examples of the things that come through on the secondary, and sometimes during the interview, mm -hmm. depending right. on how the interviews are set up. So it gives us another dimension. So you can have 45 on the MCATs. I will tell you, I've seen so many 45s and 4.0s or near 4.0s in people who don't have a clue. Just don't have a clue. Because they spent all their time, time studying. studying. Yeah. Don't know what the next... Uh, would walk into a restaurant and be abusive and offensive to someone waiting on you. And so it's our job as a, an admissions committee to answer the question of whether we think they can do the academic piece by any number of ways, not just an MCAT score and a GB, the rigor of the courses that they have chosen to take. Are they afraid to take something that's hard? So we take a bunch of easy courses and get a 4.0 versus the person who's a 3.0 but was brave enough to take upper-level courses, things that changed, that challenged them academically. Were they inquisitive enough to go and seek out and, and experience in a lab during the summer? Were they people who took advantage of, of programs like MED or SNDP, things that would broaden their horizons, that tell us that they're going to be the people who will academically not be afraid to fail, to take a chance. And then on the other hand, did they get themselves ready? Did they go out and do something for somebody else other than themselves? Yeah, right. Are they unselfish? Have they had to deal with something that was powerful and potentially devastating to them? And how did they solve it? Knowing that there's not a correct way it's their way. Mm -hmm. And so when, when I'm talking to students about preparing for medical school, I want them not to be afraid of rigor. I want them to approach their academic course in a logical, methodical way. I got to take these courses, which is why they got to read MSOC, Medical School Admissions Requirements. And every school has a copy of it. It's online now. So no one can say, I didn't know UNC wanted me to have this, so Duke wanted me to have that. I'm it's, sorry. Remember I'm that. I'm sorry. Every Medical school, school admissions requirements. No excuses. You've been told. I'm sorry. And yeah. so they should know that. Then they have to figure out, well, which schools? I, I'm from, let's take North Carolina. Four medical schools in North Carolina. There is no reason why students should not apply to all of the schools that are in their state. Because all of us will, not preferentially, but we have a whole bunch of students from North Carolina. He has a lot of students. ECU has all of their students can from ask, North Carolina. Can I ask a question? So one of the questions that comes up on a diverse medicine forum is financing these applications. So. So a lot of students will say, I can't afford to apply to all that's why they. Schools. That's why there's fee waiver. Yeah, there are fee waivers. And unfortunately, there's, there's not a source of funds just yet that students can apply for. However, you know, uh, we're working behind the scenes, talking with different groups, such as the National Medical Fellowship Program, yeah. which actually funds you once you get into medical school, the United Negro College Fund, which funds you while you're an undergraduate, and trying to figure out how the two of them or some other entity could work on developing that type of a pipeline fund rate, uh, funds for students who want to apply to multiple schools but don't have that financial ability. Yeah, we recognize that as a very, as a very crucial aspect. And it's also, uh, Dr. Dale, one of the reasons why students apply to medical school late. That's right. Because, you know, they're having to work to find the money or they're waiting for their parents to find the money. Or, and it, it makes their application get later and later. And the later your application comes in, the, the greater 
competition that you have because slots kind of go. We we for most of medical schools have kind of a rolling admissions that we're rolling our admissions as we go along. We don't wait all the way to a certain date and then throw in 50% of the class, then go back, review all the application, and throw the other 50% in. We roll them in as we go along. So by rolling admissions, you mean if I apply um, in August, there's a chance I could get accepted in September by right. October. Yeah. Yeah, while other students are still applying. While still okay. applying. And that's all the spots are getting taken up as the year is going but on. But that's where MSR right. becomes critical. Very true. Because all of that information about the admissions process for every school in the country is in IMSA. So we don't roll, for instance. We send all of our acceptances out on one day in March. But UNC does, and then most schools in the country actually roll. It's rare to not roll. But getting back to the business of, of funding this, that's why you have to be methodical. You have to, as far as I'm concerned, you should apply to the schools in your state. Because most states have an obligation, because they're funded by the legislatures, they have to take X percentage of their students from the state. Even the private schools? No, not the private, private schools, schools, but schools that receive funding from the leg their legislatures have to do that. And, you know, it just makes sense that if you're in the state of North Carolina, and we get a lot of applications from students from North Carolina. Yeah. And so they they should always do that. That's almost like it, it's like your fallback. It, it is it, it's where you're going to have a much higher chance of getting into medical school. And then you have to decide well, what am I looking for? What, what what kind of school environment am I gonna look for? Right. And, and what exactly. is the track record and what is the school noted for? If you're not interested in research, and that's a completely different discussion for me, but if you're not interested in research and you know that X school is a research intensive school, then why would you apply to it? Well, you think that might be the only school you can get into? No, it usually isn't the case. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. So, you, it, 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 one of the things that Cedric said that wasn't emphasized enough is that the process of getting into medical school is a proactive process that the student, the students have to take ownership of this. And so they got to figure out some fundamental questions. Do I want to go to a school that does a whole bunch of research? Do I want to go to a school that is very well known for its clinical training of students and send most of their students into clinical medicine or some mix of the, of the two? Do I want to go far away from home? Is there a compelling reason for me to stay near home? And for many students, there are. The bottom line here is to get trained and go out and, and practice. Mm -hmm. that, that's the bottom line. So you have to decide what you think you're going to be satisfied with. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, there are some people who will apply to 30 schools, mm -hmm. but the average number of schools to get into medical school for everybody is about 15. To apply to 15 and you'll mm -hmm. get it, really. Mm -hmm. And again, it's deliberate. You have to be deliberate. You have to sit down and say, but I want to live. What kind of medical school environment do I want to be in? And what is it going to cost me on the back end? Right. And, then, and really, that's probably one of the bigger drivers now is, is indebtedness. That's right. You know, and then that's, that's where an in-state school has an advantage over a private school. That's right. So, you know, that's another component of it. Uh, but, you know, you mentioned the aspect of, of students having to understand where they want to go, mm -hmm. right? And I'll just use me as an example. When I graduated from a college and took a year off as went and worked, that's what really confirmed that I needed to go to medical school <laughs> because the job that I had working as a paralegal was just not something I could see myself doing forever. So that really made me decide I need to go back, study a little harder for that MCAT test. Yeah. Okay. So I went back and did that, but I only applied to two schools. Mm -hmm. I applied to Carolina and I applied to East Carolina mm -hmm. because I'm a North Carolina resident. Mm -hmm. 
And there was, for me, the, the, the value of the education. It was a value proposition. The value of the education versus the cost of the education, it was just a no-brainer. Yeah. You know, when I went to medical school, I care a lot of, I hate to really say this because it seems like it was forever ago, but, uh, you know, my tuition was $1,400 a year. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, wow. Well, yeah, $1,400 a year. You know, and still now, uh, when we look at the value proposition, the Carolina admissions, uh, the Carolina in-state tuition is about $18,000. Our average student, by the time they graduate with an in-state in -state residency, is in debt less than a, about $108,000 is what they come out in debt up to. Okay? You know what the national average? Oh, the national. It's 150000 for a public institution and close to 200000 for private, a private. Inst institutions hmm. after four years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, see, that can make a big difference in where students decide to go to school as well. Mm -hmm. But what I will tell, you know, students is, you know, for what you will do once you get to the other side, that indebtedness is really nothing. Because you will recoup that and more once you get to the other side. So don't be afraid to go into debt, but let your debt also be a motivator for you that you cannot fail. Yeah. Okay? Because the worst thing you can do is get halfway through medical school and have all that debt. And then not finish. That's yeah. right. You know? Because that debt then becomes due right mm -hmm. away. Okay. Exactly. That's right. It becomes due so, right away. So, you know, and then here's the other thing, you know, Dr. Dell. You know, students, you know, not only at the medical school level, but at the undergraduate level, must learn what you know and what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And that's crucial. Because when you have the ability to discern what you don't know, that's when you become empowered to know how to go get help. Yeah. And one of the things that I see a lot of students thinking is that they can do all of this on their own. Mm -hmm. And the honest truth of it is, just as it takes a village to raise a child, it probably takes that same village to raise a doctor. Yeah. You know, and you know, some of the schools that are going to be the most successful where students see other students like themselves who form communities that support each other. And therefore, everybody succeeds because that rising tide lifts the boat that everybody is in. And people are conscientious not to leave people out. Okay? That's the kind of environment that you also want to look for at a school. If you go to a school and it's all cutthroat, me, I don't want to be there. Because that's not the type of person I am. I want to try to help somebody along the way. Because I didn't get there on my own. Somebody helped me as well. You know? So that's another component that we that we have to talk about when it comes to how do I choose a medical school? So part of it is indebtedness. Part of it is climate and culture. Part of it is the history of the school. Another part is, is does, that, does the school meet the need for which I want to go to medical school for? Uh, and then, you know, am I going to be supported? So in terms of... Um Picking a school, I'm just going to say, open ended question here and just respond however you want. Historically, black colleges and universities and medical school, HBCs, what are your thoughts? From medical school? From medical can, school. I, can I go first on this one? Yeah, you can. So, my <laughs> thoughts on it, Dale, are that.